Professor Peter Harper, you and I have known each other for 30 odd years, I suppose, and some of it's been in the lung cancer area and some the other area. Yeah. <laughs> you are a very experienced observer of uh, uh, life in the lung cancer uh, area, the delivery of care and the research feeding in. So I'd really love to hear what you think of the present state of the art. Is this meeting in Geneva adding to the state of the art? How's it all affecting uh, delivery at, uh, at the sharp end uh, where you've worked at guys for I suppose 35 years. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I think this meeting is addressing the issues. I think it is an excellent small focus meetings as so often these meetings are more effective than the rather larger meetings uh, and I think that's why they're so well attended and that's why every session is so well attended. Uh, the two aspects that I would like to address really are more on uh, how you direct treatment. The first is on cancer in the elderly, which is mm -hmm. something that I've worked on for 20 years. Essentially, for many years, we were uh, crying in the wilderness. People didn't really uh, note that the median age for patients in trial was probably 62, whereas what we know is that most of the patients who come to see us are older than 62. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, it's somewhere near the top end of the 60s. Uh, and so we have very little experience on how to direct treatment in the 70s and the 80s and now in the 90-year-old population. And as we all know, the over 65s in the Western world are the fastest growing segment of the population. So there I think we've made some real strides. A lot of that work's come out of Italy with Gridelli, uh, now out of France with Elizabeth Croix and uh, people will be delighted to know that at ASCO she's got a plenary session oh, wow. uh, which is comparing two different single agents, gemcitabine and navalbine, uh, to a standard doublet carbotaxol in patients over 65. And I think this is what is needed. We need to know how to treat a very significant segment of the population where we haven't had to this moment guidance from clinical trials. Mm. So those clinical trials are coming up and are going to be important. Another aspect which I'm personally very involved in now is bone and bone secondaries in lung cancer. Here for many years we've had no guidelines as to whether to use a bisphosphonate or indeed whether we need to look for bone metastasis in non-small cell lung cancer and I think there's compelling evidence now that we ought to be and we ought to be thinking very seriously about the structural elements of the patient which can cause them to lose their independence. Sure. So once a patient loses their independence, the corollary is they become dependent and they go downhill very quickly. So I think stopping skeletal related events, if you can, is a very important factor. And, and this is, uh, is now um, being investigated? I mean, there's a vast yes. literature in breast and in prostate yeah. and so on. And You're quite and right. And, and you've now got stuff coming through on Yeah, the huge trials are going to come out this year and the beginning of next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, which will address this issue. Antibodies or bisphosphonates? The, no, mostly bisphosphonates. Okay. The, the nature of the rank ligand is that all of us think it's a very significant um, product which really is going to change things, but at the moment it's, uh, it's all on hold, I think, since some rather surprising results in breast cancer with mm. the rank ligand. So we're going to have to rethink it. So at the moment the bisphosphonates, you know their safety profile, sure. you know the side effect profile, and I think you're going to see some really impressive uh, improvements in event, not only events, but also probably in survival. And of course, in osteoporosis, you get an added benefit. Yeah. If you believe that literature, which I think I do. Oh, yes, and I do too. Uh, we're well used to it. There are guidelines in every single tumor type that you would commonly associate with bone secondaries or bone events from breast cancer to myeloma sure. to kidney cancer to even prostate cancer. Uh, but there are no guidelines suggesting bisphosphonates in lung cancer, and I think they, we really ought to look at those. Where do you think it's going to um, take, uh, take place, the bisphosphonate intervention? Uh, probably exactly at the same time as the chemotherapy, as the cytostatics. Yeah. Okay. New medicines coming along, I think? Um, yes and no. Um, in lung cancer, we, we really have uh, had a lot of uh, evidence with the... It's, it's maintenance, isn't it? And whether you call maintenance early second-line treatment or maintenance, right. I think for many of us, the maintenance trials in a group of patients who've responded 
it really is early second line treatment. But it does seem to be positive and if the side effect profile is appropriate then that would be a good way forward. As yet none of us are doing it I think in our everyday clinical practice but I think if more clinical trials come out and show this as a positive benefit to the patient and here in metastatic disease we're looking at quality of life okay. uh, then I think it's important. Costs of, uh, of the new medicines is this interfering with your practice? Uh, yes in the UK um, special case. A special case so we need to understand the that the government has put in an, um, a group called the National Institute of Clinical Excellence which is a cost effective mm. assessment and cost effectiveness for some is not necessarily cost effectiveness for a nation. I think it's got, I think NICE, this institution, has got it wrong with some cancers where there are no other treatments, for instance, advanced kidney cancer, where at the moment we can't use uh, drugs which we should be using, tyrosin kinase inhibitors. Uh, but in lung cancer, I think it's been on the whole pretty straightforward. So we have had EGFR uh, and we've had EGFR um, antagonists. Um, very appropriately targeted, I think. You need to know the mutation status, and I'm happy with that. Mm. Do you expect more targets to come up and uh, more yes. individualization? Uh, or do or or you think the pharma companies are holding back a little bit because they don't see so much profit? Although with this elderly population being treated now and taken more seriously, as you pointed out, yeah. this might add a little bit of more profit to their coffers. Yes, I mean, we all agree that many of the advances that have taken place have taken place because pharma has done the correct trials. We also know that pharma does some trials which we think, you know, there's no way this trial is going to alter clinical practice, even if it's positive. So pharma does need to look at its trial structure. They're very expensive products, mm. trials. But on the whole, most of the advances we've had have come through pharma, and I think the EGFR story, uh, where we saw two populations coming out of a trial, and even though a trial was negative, we could see there was a population which did benefit, and then they drilled down, and you have the mutational status. That wouldn't have come, I think, without stimulus from pharmacy, uh, from pharma, even though, of course, it was done in academic centres. Okay. Peter, thank you very much indeed for thank giving you. us your time. I really thank appreciate you. it.